the parable from Jesus that we will hear today was told to a particular audience in response to some particular questioning. When Jesus told this parable, he had gone to Jerusalem and was in the temple courts, the big giant church, the grand temple there in Jerusalem, the big courtyards where many would gather before and after worship to hear teachers and Bible studies. Jesus was there teaching and speaking to the crowds, but that meant that the people who were in charge of the temple and in charge of the church were extra upset at him that day. These are the chief priests and elders, those religious leaders like the Pharisees who never liked Jesus all throughout his ministry because of all those radical, unorthodox things he said that went against the law of the Old Testament. So here in the temple courts, they confront him. And if you read the verses right before our text at the beginning, beginning of verse 23, you will see this scene as it is set up and as they confront him. Instead of letting himself get into an arguing match, Jesus tells them this story. Here is a reading from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 21 verses 28 through 32. Hear now the word of the Lord. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first They answered, Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John the Baptist came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. May God bless the reading of of this holy word today. So here Jesus compares the church's leaders with that second son who claimed he would do the father's work, but then didn't. And it's easy for us as we read the story to judge him for dropping the ball here. But we should never be too quick to judge since don't we do that too sometimes make a claim or a promise and then don't follow through maybe it's a new year's resolution that starts off strong at the beginning of the year but peters out by january the 4th maybe it's a new routine we want to start and after a few weeks meh Maybe it's learning a new skill that we never get too many lessons into. Whatever it is, we do it for a while, then we just don't get around to it anymore, and we spend our time on other things. We said we wanted to do it, but we weren't committed enough to actually do it. As I was reading this parable and thinking about that this week's, people who said they wanted to do something but then really showed that they didn't. I couldn't help but think back to a few experiences I had back when I used to be an editor. After I got out of seminary, for a few years I worked for a Christian publishing company as an editor of Bible study curriculum, and I would contract a different writer for each month of lessons. 
And usually they were ministers or pastors or religion professors or something like that. People who knew and could write big, good, robust lesson plans for our readers. Sometimes I would get a recommendation about a good person to ask and I would invite them to write a month and they'd say yes and it would go well. Other times people would reach out to me and they would say, hey, I am interested in writing a month of Bible study lessons. And I would say, okay, great, here's an opportunity. And in the event that a writer really fell through on me and left me in a real bind, I made sure to budget a time cushion window just in case, just in case something went wrong. And surprisingly, of the writers who really dropped the ball, it was the ones who had asked me for the opportunity to write. They said they wanted to write a month of Bible study lessons and could turn it in on time, but they did not. So I wanted to share a wild example. It was from a writer who had asked me. He was a, a university professor of Old Testament. He'd gotten his PhD from Princeton, and you would know the university if I said it, but I don't want to, I don't want to name names here. I thought he would do a great job, that he would definitely be right on time and really reliable, but he was definitely not in such an amazing way that I saved his email excuses and printed them out and enjoy them even years later. So I'm just going to read a couple, and this is half. It, it gets wild, but this is just a taste. So on October the 20th, a Friday, he says, Dear Stuart, I should be able to finish all the Bible study lessons today, but it may be Monday. It's been a lot of fun writing them. Okay, that's all right. It was, it was the due date, but, you know, if it's Monday, that's not bad. Okay. Uh, a week and a half later, two weeks later, on Thursday, Dear Stuart, I'm sorry you haven't heard from me in a few days. I'm trying to finish the lessons tonight, but we'll definitely have material to you on Monday. I'm so sorry for the delay. That was Thursday. Uh, let's see. 11 days later, Monday. Dear Stuart, things have been very non-conducive to getting work finished, but I'm trying to close things up. I will be finished by Wednesday morning. That was on Monday. Fast forward two more weeks. Dear Stuart, I sort of lost touch there for a few days, but I'm back on track now. I should really be done on Friday. That was a Tuesday. Fast forward uh, three more weeks. December 18th, Monday. I'm trying to finish the lessons as we speak. My plan is to finish them before going to sleep. Okay, so remember he said that. He's not going to go to sleep until he finishes these. It's December 18th. Fast forward four days. Stuart, we were traveling all day yesterday. It must have been dangerous if you haven't slept for four days. <laughs> I'm so sorry for the delay. Here are the first three teacher guide lessons. You will have the rest of everything by the end of the day today, December 22nd. Next email, December 26, 2 a.m. So that's like Christmas day, night, night, middle of the night, Tuesday, 2 a.m. Dear Stuart, here's the last teaching guide and the first student guide lesson. I'll send the rest tomorrow, right when they're finished. Two days later, December 28th, 4 a.m. Stuart, I think this should do it. Here's everything. Again, I am very sorry to take so long. I should have done more in October. Thanks. I think that goes without saying. And do remember, October 20th, he said, I should be able to finish the lessons today. And then over two months later, ah, he finally turned them in. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I can't tell you how bothered I was getting, how stressed I was getting. He was eating up all of my time cushion because he said he could do this thing, and then he really didn't. And instead of just stringing me along and along, just be honest about what's really happening. Give me an honest read on it. We'll work it out together. We'll figure it out together. 
I'm sure the father in the parable would have felt the same way about the second son. Once the son knew that he wasn't going to be working in the vineyard that day, he should have gone to the father and come up with a plan. But just letting it go, just not showing up, shows disrespect and selfishness. He said the right thing at first, but his actions didn't back it up. So don't just talk the talk, you gotta walk the walk, right? It's like the old saying, talk is cheap. It's not worth near as much as real action, real work, really taking care of something or taking care of somebody. That is valuable, but talk is cheap. However, I have noticed that a lot of people can be swayed by fancy talk. Talk may be cheap, but it can buy you a long line of credit with some people. Because the more confident your talk sounds, the louder that you talk, the more people will totally believe you. Even if what you're saying is a complete lie, if you say it strong enough with confidence, then people will just assume that you're being completely honest, that you're telling it like it is. And they'll think, oh, I like him. He sounds so sincere. He must be trustworthy. Well, sounding passionate is one thing. Having depth and substance and authenticity, that's something else. Preachers, I'll let you know, are the worst about that. A lot of them will speak so boldly and earnestly even though they don't really have a lot to say. But the more passion you put into it makes it sound so deep. There are a lot of ministers I know, and I wonder if they were really called to ministry or if they just wanted people to listen to them. Hmm, I wonder. And of course, as we know, politicians are notorious for doing that, promising to do something, whether it's helpful or a dumb idea, then never getting real things done. But like I said, that's kind of a human trait. We all do that. Think about relationships. When people first start dating, and I think we can all recognize that men might be a little worse about this than women, since guys are notorious for being super sweet when they're interested in a girl and trying to court her with flowers and candy and taking her nice places, writing sweet love letters, whispering sweet nothings in her ear. I love you more. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. Oh, and it's so sweet. But then what happens? Later, after the wedding, it's flowers. What do you need flowers for? I told you I loved you. I mean, that's good enough, right? What more do you want? And I admit, I am the worst of sinners when it comes to things like that. The very first day of our honeymoon, Sarah said to me, she just remarked, uh, oh, your, your hair is looking pretty wild today. Are you not going to comb it? like usual. And I said, hey, I'm married now. I don't got to impress anybody. <laughs> what do I care what I look like? <laughs> oh, isn't that sad? Isn't that sad for her? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. She deserves your pity for sure. So don't do that. Don't stop caring, right? Always give. Always work from the heart. Always mean it and show up. Don't be like the second son. If you say something, make sure that you mean it and you follow through. Especially when it comes to faith and when it comes to religious practices. Even if you say what you think are the right words, if they aren't followed up with real live Jesus action, then they don't mean anything. They're just words. 
They're just air. And you don't want to be, you don't want to be uh, full of hot air, do you? That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He said that even if he spoke the most awesomest things that blew everyone's minds, but he didn't have real love, then it all meant nothing. He said, I would be like an annoying, clanging symbol if I didn't have love. That reminds me of a really moving worship song that I love. So I just want to play you one minute of this moving worship song that is about that same theme. Did you hear that? He sang, we could sing all the highest praise, but if we don't have love, we're left with nothing. And when that's the case, then other people will see that there is nothing in us. I think about the Good Samaritan story. When a man was attacked on the road and lay injured on the side of the road as like a minister walked by and saw him and then kept walking. And then a person like a deacon walked by and saw him and then kept walking. And that parable doesn't say if the injured man was conscious or not. But what if, as he lay on the side of the road, when he heard someone walking by, he could open his eyes a little bit and have hope? that person might stop and help, and then he saw them keep walking by? What would that man have thought about ministers and deacons after that? He would have thought, what a bunch of hypocrites. They claim to follow God, but there's obviously no love in their hearts. And the same thing happens today. One of the biggest reasons that people give for not going to church these days is the hypocrisy and total lack of Christ-like love that they see. They hear Christians or pastors talking about a God of love, but then they don't show love in their lives. So either they must be hypocrites or God isn't loving at all and those angry Christians are doing exactly what they're supposed to. Either way, it ensures that people won't go to church. They hear Christians who talk the loudest and assume that all of them are like that. And they say, no thanks. I don't need to go to church to hear that. And a lot of times, those Christians in those churches that are full of love, real Christ-like love, will suffer consequences because of that kind of reputation and that hypocrisy. In fact, just last Thursday, a good friend of mine who moved here a little over a year ago, he said to me, he kind of confessed it to me, he said, when I first got to town, and I saw the Baptist church, I thought I knew what it would be like because I've heard Baptist preachers and I don't like them and I don't want any part of a Baptist church. 
But then I met you and I got to know you and my eyes were opened. And I realized I was wrong. Hmm. Being loud or spouting off holy words won't really accomplish anything, but showing Christ-like love always will. In the book that we've been reading lately for our Big Questions book club that meets every other Monday, the author of the book, his father was a Presbyterian minister in upstate New York. And one time the author asked his father, hey, what do you say to families who have just lost a loved one to death? And he was curious. He just wanted to know. And he thought his dad would have some deep words of wisdom as a longtime pastor to impart to him. But his dad said, well, I mostly just make the coffee. Hmm. And the son was confused at first hearing that answer. But then he later realized there's not much you can do in the face of death, but just be there with them and maybe make some coffee. There are no words you can say to lessen their deep sadness, no magic words that can make the sadness go away, but you can be there, you can show up, you can make some coffee, you can share some food. And that's far more helpful than words. In our verses today, Jesus asked, which of the two sons did what the father wanted? And it was the one who showed up, the one who went to work, not the one who talked, who said the right thing, but the one who got up and who did the right thing. And what's really interesting is that the son who did show up, did the work, did the right thing, he didn't even talk the talk at all. All he did was just change his mind about how he was living and decided to do the right thing. And Jesus said that's what pleased the father, doing the right thing. Talking the talk is okay if... Somebody asks you a question and you answer and you, you, know, you give an honest response and you talk and use good words. But remember what will really please God, no matter what you've said, how you've talked, or even what you've done in the past. If you show up and do the Lord's work now, Jesus said that is truly the way to enter into the kingdom. Now, it is okay, however, to recognize that the first son's initial no to his father was still bad. Like, that was the wrong thing to say. We can recognize that. And it is still true that the second son's initial yes, sir, is definitely the right answer. It's the great answer that any parent longs to hear when they tell their kid to do something. That is the right answer. That's the answer you want. And as a parent, you hear that answer so rarely <laughs> that when you do hear it, you get downright giddy. If it happens that your child easily agrees to do some chore that you've asked them to do, and they say, sure, I'll take care of it, you think, it's a miracle. <laughs> they're they're going to do that willingly with no dissent. That's the great best answer. And the application that Jesus gives after the parable, it's not like the greedy tax collectors or the prostitutes were suddenly people without fault who had never done anything bad. They had definitely done bad things, sure. And the church leaders that Jesus was talking to were definitely still upstanding citizens. 
if not a little judgy, I suppose. And maybe the first son was like that. Maybe the first son was always upstanding, if not a little judgy. And when he heard that the first son, like if the, if the, second, the second son always said the right thing, when he heard that the first son who told his father no didn't get in trouble and wasn't punished, but instead was allowed to help in the family business? Well, maybe the son who always said the right thing, maybe he thought, well, that's just not fair. He should have been punished. If you say no to your parents, you should be punished. And maybe the son that always says the right things, maybe he thought, well, if, if that's the way it's going to be, if he's not going to be punished, then maybe I just don't want to work in dad's vineyard at all. I just won't even show up for work today. I'll show him. And maybe if that son ran into the vineyard workers from our parable last week, the ones who had worked all day but were only paid as much as the ones who'd worked an hour, well, I'm sure they would have had a lot to commiserate about with each other. I think God's children and God's workers still do the same thing today when they hear that God loves people they disapprove of just as much as them. Tax collectors, prostitutes, fill in the blank with whatever the bad things or people are these days. And that God offers the same forgiveness no matter how good or bad you have been? Well, that's just not right. Maybe some of you have been kind of like me in life. You grew up always going to church, which I did, pretty much always doing the right thing, beaming with arrogant pride as a child for earning all those Bible memory verse awards like I did. Maybe we are more like the Pharisees and the chief priests than we would care to admit. Upstanding, boring, a little judgy, maybe. So we need to remember that if we act like that, then we have failed at the gospel and we have hid its light under a bushel of arrogance and selfishness. And we have no longer maintained a faith in God's amazing grace. It doesn't matter what you say. It matters what you do. It matters if you show up. And it matters if you show love and do that godly, Christ-like work out in the world. That's why Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There is so much love that needs to be shared, so much good news the world needs to hear. There are so few people who are willing to actually show up and show that amazing Christ-like love. Let us do that this week. Let us pray. Oh God, we confess that we have done a great job of saying the right words and promising the right things and sounding so perfect and holy. But we have done a poor job of showing Jesus out in the world. That we have done a poor job of working out in the trenches, going to the highways and hedges and loving all people, whether we think they deserve it or not. Oh God, we pray that you would convict us today so that we would be 
a child of yours that shows up, that gets out there, that does your work, that, that spreads your love, that helps others know your grace is available to them. Encourage us to work more in your vineyard, O oh God, and remind us that on the days that we do, those days will be the most fulfilling, the most enjoyable, and the most abundant for us. Amen.